The Accidental Entrepreneur is brought to you with the help of our sponsor, A. Weber, the world's leading small business email marketing and automation service provider. Since 1998, A. Weber has helped more than 1 million small businesses and entrepreneurs through its suite of web-based email marketing, automation tools, and education. A. Weber, the best option when it comes to marketing your business. The podcast is also brought to you by the Alternative Board. Since 1989, the Alternative Board, or TAB, has been one of the leading peer advisory and business coaching organizations for independent business owners and CEOs across the world. By facilitating peer advisory boards, private one-on-one coaching, and strategic planning services, TAB helps business owners improve their businesses in ways that change their lives. And be sure to check out our affiliate sponsor, One of One Productions, the New Jersey-based podcast studio that produces and edits both audio and video podcasts. They sell equipment for the avid podcaster and have even created a guesting kit exclusively for our listeners. And be sure to support the podcast by ordering some logo merchandise from our online store. Listen to all of our sponsors' commercials later in this episode and follow their links in the show notes to learn more about their products and services. Going beyond the transaction. So if you're a landscaper, it is not just, I came and I cut your lawn today. Right. What's the real outcome? The real outcome is, I came and cut your lawn so you can relax this weekend and enjoy time with your family and not have to work in the yard. Or because... I came and cut your lawn and you can be assured when people drive down your street, your house, will stand your up. outdoor environment will turn heads. Feeling There's a higher lawn. hit. Lawn's cut. And, and I think that, uh, isn't it a good feeling when you come home and the lawn's cut? Yes. And yes. Oh, and everything looks so clean and you want to walk around the back. Yes. I don't think landscapers take enough advantage of that. I don't think that they really realize the marketing opportunity, right? To their customers, they come home. They should leave something, a card. I hope you enjoy your backyard, you know. Think of me when you're having a drink on the the lawn. I don't know. Well, you know, one of the opening lines in a homepage that I did for um, a big landscaper out in Silicon Valley was come home to your outdoor oasis. Yeah. Um, So, again, there's an emotional. Paints a picture. There. It paints a picture. It's very visual. It is not just cutting the lawn. Right. Okay. Welcome back to another great episode of the podcast. If you are listening on your favorite directory and can leave a review, please leave us a five-star review. If you're watching us, me and Barbara on YouTube, like us, subscribe, ring the bell, scream, yell, do whatever you're going to do. And um, I'm so excited. We had a great guest, good friend of mine who missed our Friday morning meeting today, Barbara, but... um, We'll talk about that. You're on mute. So once we get through the credits and then, uh, yeah, let's get on with the show. The information provided in these episodes is for entertainment purposes only. It is not a guarantee of success or to be construed as advice of any kind. You should always seek advice from local licensed professionals before making any decisions. The dictionary defines an entrepreneur as a person who organizes and manages any enterprise, especially a business, usually with considerable initiative and risk. People often start a business without much choice, perhaps due to a job loss or just being dissatisfied at work, and they come up with an idea they just know can be successful. They become entrepreneurs by accident. That is to say their success or failure happens by accident, not with intention. My name is Mitch Beinhacker. I'm a corporate attorney and a business advisor. You're listening to The Accidental Entrepreneur my podcast about how to achieve success on purpose, not by accident. Join me along with our monthly guests where we share our knowledge and help you get a hold of your business. And now on to today's episode. Hello, I am Barbara Menino and I am a content writer and my work involves creating impact for my clients through creative content, content strategy, and powerful storytelling. I've been doing it for a long time. As a matter of fact, sometimes I go back to when I was 12 and I first learned to speak my piece and realized how important it is to tell your story. And I'm here today to talk shop with Mitch. Happy to be here to talk shop with him and to tell some of my story. All right, Barbara, I kind of put you on the spot there. You missed you on the 
this morning's meeting uh, and you were on mute. So I, I apologize. And, you know, listening to these openings, it's like copyright writing. So I'm like on the spot here. You're listening to what I wrote, my scripts and if you like it or you don't like it. So uh, but thanks for coming on the show. I know we had to reschedule at one point. Yeah, I'm I'm thrilled to be on. And um, I've been interested in your podcast for a long time. And by the way, you are right. An opening is very much akin to what I do. Yeah. And I got to tell you, I thought yours was very engaging. I Thank think you. it almost made me a little teary. Good. Thanks. Thanks so much. Well, if you ever have any comments or questions or thoughts or ideas, I'm always, you know, I'm, uh, I'm always open to that stuff. I love to improve things. So thanks for coming. And we're going to talk today about you know, writing copy and content and writing good content, because it's really the name of the game nowadays, right, with being out there and it travels the world so quickly, right? Um, But maybe we can go backward and talk about, you know, your background, your history, what you grew up with and how you got into journalism and all that type of stuff, because you have a great story. And then maybe in the second half, we can get into tips and pointers and, you know, how people can connect with you, all that type of stuff. Does that make sense? Makes sense to me. And it works. So let's go back and start with your story. Okay, well, you know, um, as a writer, I always dig deep to find my clients' gifts and their story. And increasingly, I dig deep to find mine. I hope so. And just recently, you know, that's Shoemaker Shoes, Hero is the yeah, Last, right? right? Of course. You know how that works. Yeah. So uh, just recently, I was telling someone a story, and I thought, significant moment in my life. I was 11. I lived in London with my family because my dad worked for what is now Exxon, and we were transferred. And being a kid in London, it was very trendy to take riding lessons on Saturday mornings. Okay. And so I fell right into the trend. I had the helmet, the perfect jacket, the joppers, the shoes. I looked pretty cool. (laughs) And every Saturday, uh, an instructor by the name of Miss Dixon, I can say her name, I'm sure, um, took me into Hyde Park on a horse named Biscuit. Wow. It was English saddle. We yeah. posted. It was the ultimate. Unbelievable. But, You're in England? I mean, wow. Yeah, that was a great experience at uh, 12 years old, 11 and 12. So I had mastered the art of posting with the English saddle. But one Saturday, she invited, instead of having a private lesson, some more advanced kids to join the class. And suddenly, I fell in the ranks. I no longer got to ride Biscuit, but she gave me a little runt of a horse. And the saddle that she gave me was too big, and I was kind of leaning to the side, posting, you know, sideways. Yeah, that wasn't nice. And there we were in Hyde Park, me yeah. on an angle posting, <laughs> and suddenly the horse went faster and faster and faster. And unbeknownst to me, she had taken the speed up to a canter, which I had never done. And you are not supposed to post in a canter because you'll post your way out of the saddle. Posting is when you kind of go up and down, right? Yes, exactly. Flying off the horse. Exactly. My daughter. Wow. Yeah. Oh, she drew. She's a a rider. A couple years she was riding. Yeah. Three or four years. Well, my, mine was short-lived also <laughs> after this event <laughs> because a like near to died. And finally, after a few, I don't know, what seemed like interminable moments, but yeah. I'm sure they were seconds of fear, I screamed out, stop. And at 11 years old, I came to the realization that you really had to represent your authentic self. In yeah. fact... The next year, I became editor. We were back in Westfield at that time. I became editor of the Rough Rider at Roosevelt Middle School. Ah, so you were back here then at that. So you're only over there temporarily. Yeah, my, a year, a little you over a year. Did fell off the horse that day? Never fell off the horse, the horse because stop? I spoke out. Did the horse Well, stop? Miss Miss Dixon stopped it. everything. <laughs> but let me tell you something. I was a persona non grata. She didn't like that I did that. Uh, She didn't like that I spoke out to her, that I interrupted, that I talked out in front of all these other kids. Didn't matter to me. I saved my life. So two things happened within, what, 14 months of each other. 
I saved my life. I learned the importance of speaking out, which as an only child can be difficult because you can be a little timid. And then I took that awareness to the journalistic page as I became editor of The Rough Rider, went on as an editor of The High Zai, yeah, did all writing her. stuff in My college. Daughter wrote the high Zai, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. there you go. And actually then got back into journalism hmm, a little bit, just a little bit later. Strangely, I started in banking. Who knows? I think because I thought there were going to be cute guys and the salaries were higher. Did you major in journalism in college? I majored in English. So I went to Connecticut College, which is a liberal arts college. So they didn't offer journalism, but definitely English. English. Yeah, it's definitely a broader company. Yeah. Right. So, um, and I know your daughter wants to go to a big university. Yeah, my little one wants to. Well, my other one's at Maryland. She is a journalism major. Uh, she wants Yay. to go into medicine, so she's doing a prereqs, but she felt that if she doesn't like medicine, she's a very good writer. She loves writing, and she'd have something to fall back on. And I said, you know, maybe you'll be writing, you know, medical thrillers. I don't know. And also, I mean, there's opportunity for speaking as a medical practitioner. There's opportunity to write papers. Right. Articles in magazines. So yeah, the two the schools, the medical schools, like when they're you're not just a science major. I think they yeah, yeah they're looking for diversity. But it brings lot, right? it definitely she's, brings more to the table. Masters is a uh, is a journalist at the Washington Post, and she's got to write things for for him and get things published, and then and, you know, and then she's got the medical stuff, and yeah, she's got a lot of pressure on her. But she you know she's an achiever. She wants to do it, and she was I think on high eye. She wasn't the editor, but she wrote a couple of articles and. That's like an award-winning high school newspaper, isn't it? Yeah, it yeah. was great. I think it's um, back. Yeah, yeah. We it was you were it was really a proud moment to be part of the high yeah, high. And time. I was the front page editor, and then instead of being the editor in chief, that was one avenue. I decided to be the news bureau editor because I got to work with a lot of the newspapers in the area oh. and oftentimes interviewed state representatives, people okay. like that. So yeah. I was really out in the trenches. Right. Yeah. That's better than being the editor. Editor, you just kind of supervise everybody. You don't really do anything. Yeah. And yeah. those layouts all the time. So, um, I started in banking. I quickly got out of that. Um, and soon thereafter I had kids And it was when I had kids that I went back to journalism, and that is where I stayed. Weekly Uh, newspaper, features, news stories, exactly. Had a column called Around and About Warren. I was one of the most popular people at parties. It was a (laughs) ton of fun. Yeah. Uh, And that was the hook that got me into corporate life. So I helped revamp a corporate newsletter. And then I went into covering the financial services industry for AM Best. See, so you came back to finance. I definitely did. I And that early banking, which seemed horrendous at the time, served me well when I was covering financial services. Yeah. I interviewed incredible people. Bob Ben Moshe, when he was um, – The head of MetLife, I interviewed him in the MetLife boardroom. He went on to be the CEO of AIG. Um, Henry Silverman, when his Sendent conglomerate went up against AIG to purchase a small company called American Bankers, and then Sendent went down in flames because of accounting fraud. And Silverman said to me at the end of nine. Pardon me? You met him before the fraud claims? I met him before the fraud, and he wasn't the one responsible for the fraud. It was someone else, but it was on his watch and destroyed his win. But at the end of the day, he said to me when I did the last interview after about nine months, he said, Barbara, you are one of the few reporters that I've um, with whom I've granted an interview. Your reporting was balanced. Your reporting was fair, and you deserve this final interview. I was delighted. I also interviewed Jerry Laybourne, who was the woman who started Oxygen Media. And I did that interview on the set of the Itzhak Mizrahi show. 
and there were all these booms and I had my own photographer and you heard the motor drive clicking (laughs) and there were lights and Jerry was on a love seat with her PR person and I was at ankles in a wing chair. And at the end of that interview, she said, you have asked fabulous questions. You really did your homework again. And you know, I'm little. I felt 10 feet tall. Yeah, I'm sure. So, well, you, but you did, but you took the time to do your preparation. You were probably yeah. good at asking questions, you know, being curious about things. And it's, you know, some people say I'm good at this. I've never had any training. I just enjoy it. I like doing it. But I think, you know, I think there's some people do have a natural, uh, you know, instinct, like as you're learning English, because my daughter, she's a very good writer, very good creative writer. You know, I, I mean, obviously I'm a little biased, but I read her stuff, That's okay. you some of her stories. When she was like, I don't know, 11, she didn't tell us. And she submitted a short story she had written to like an international contest with 1,500 applicants. And she got like top 15. They don't even know what her That's age pretty was. pretty cool. But, That's but my so cool. Like that. So I, I wonder, like, I think a lot of people have, they struggle with writing. We all go through the same stuff in school and at least until through high school. Why do you think people have so much trouble with Speaking, I understand, right? There's a lot of people would be rather be in the coffin than given the eulogy, right? We know that. <laughs> right, right. right. Exactly. <laughs> That's an interesting, it's yes. True, right? But that's true. Uh-huh. But, so, but why do people, do you think, struggle so much with writing? You know, I think when you sit down at a desk, whether it's with pen in hand or your I computer pray, screen, pray. and you're looking at that blank piece of paper, it's as big as the universe. And you think, what the heck am I going to put on that page? Blank, right? And once you start thinking that, you, it's an automatic path to writer's block. It's, yeah. it's, it's trying too hard. Do you know, as a writer, sometimes when I first sit down, I'm, I'm tense. I'm trying too hard yeah but then i just make myself do it and after moments i start getting start into a go, zone right? yeah and once i get into a zone i'm there it's even i i sort of am amused at myself i i belong to an organization called bni i know you yes. know what bni is about years ago and yeah, for those of you who don't know, every week you got to get up and do a 60 second on you. And um, I, I think about them before I get up, but I don't deeply plan them. And I get up, and the moment I say the first word, I'm out of the gate, and the words just come. And I love it. The other piece of it is I genuinely enjoy it. I was talking to someone just recently Mm -hmm. um, about a potential branding firm that I might be doing business with, doing the content piece for one of their clients. And I was recalling the day when uh, the principals of that firm and I first came in contact on another project. And there was such, if I could use the word synergy, between those principles and myself. Yeah. And it wasn't, I like you, you like me. It was two people who were genuinely in love with their craft. We really cared about the words and the emotions and the feelings that those words conveyed. And having that bent, so to speak, does contribute to what makes a good writer. Right. And well, it loosens you up, right? It flo- totally. flows your, I mean, I, I write contracts. I sometimes I have block and it's bad, but if I start putting it together and moving pieces around, looking at old contracts, it starts to come. But for some reason, like to make up a story, like to write a story, forget about it. I couldn't write a book of, I'm, I'm, I told you I have a book coming out like in a month, hopefully it'll be on Amazon. It's a business book. But I have a co-author, a friend of mine who's a publicist. It's his like 10 Ways series. I would have never have gotten this book done if it wasn't for him. And even then it was difficult. We added attorneys in that I would interview. And I'm not taking notes. So we did it on like on this platform. And then we would transcribe it and he would edit it and do it for the book. I just can't. It just It's just not a skill that I've been able to develop. I have developed the writing part of it when it comes to business contracts and things like that. 
But creative writing, forget about it. I just never been good at it. Um, you know, attorneys I find are usually good with the written word. They're usually good writers. I I've been on your website, and I don't know whether you wrote it a lot, or not. A lot of it I wrote. Yeah. I the especially the informational pieces are really good. Yeah, I might tweak. I could. Yeah, I'm sure everything needs a tweak. Though. Very clear. They're very and very sequenced. No, very technical. That type of that I can do. But if I have to like make things up, like a story about some whatever you told me, forget it. Like blank, or it doesn't sound. You know, it's not very descriptive. It, do you know? I don't know if you know of the author Elizabeth Gilder, Gilbert. She wrote. Oh. Um, she writes on creativity, but she wrote "Eat, Pray, Love." Oh, sure. That's probably yeah. And I read something she wrote on the creative process, and she said that people feel inadequate to be able to write. Maybe you're right. Yeah. And she said. They're so tied to their passion. And I almost got the sense that she recognizes that they're almost trying too hard. Yeah, that, she said what you really need. And I said that too, right? You're trying too hard. She said what you really need is curiosity. Yeah. You just have to turn your head an extra quarter inch. And that's what I tell my clients. You have to tweak your awareness. You have to good advice. L- look at life through the lens of story. Right. There's a good story sometimes just carrying a pile of clothes to the cleaners. There are adventures everywhere. You have to be kind of open to that possibility. And you'd be surprised once you start looking uh, at that perspective, once you start doing life that way. Yeah. You'd be surprised how your creativity yeah. no, increases and expands. I, think when I used to do public speaking when I was younger and nervous. I would be focusing more on my nerves than I was on the yep. actual group and the presentation and this, what I'm doing and how wonderful it is and all that kind of stuff. As you get older, right, you get more comfortable with what you're doing. You don't hear those voices in your head anymore and you don't see that and you don't feel like you're outside your body looking at yourself. That's, That's a wonderful thing about aging. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you, have, you get having ownership of things. Yeah. it's You realize it's not so daunting, you know, it's not so, you know, uh, look, I, I can do a eulogy now. I couldn't do it when I was, you know, in my twenties probably or whatever. You know? I, I did my mom's, but it was, it was hard, but yeah, she I wanted to do it. Yeah, I did my dad's also. I wasn't going to give a eulogy, but I felt that people didn't really know him as a dad. They knew him as a salesman. They knew him as a volunteer in the Jewish community. They knew him for all kinds of reasons. So I felt I should, that it was a tribute to him to do it. It was hard. Um, I probably talked too long. It's on video somewhere. I probably, probably talked an hour or something. But the kids got upset a few things. My kids actually spoke, which was impressive. I didn't think they would. And then I got up and I told the whole story of his life. And it was... Uh, that was hard. That did take a lot because I had to remember all of the stories. And then, you know, as I did write a lot of things down, more stories came out and more remembrances. There's probably more yeah. things later on that, right? When the, when your mind starts, because your mind's a funny thing. Uh, there's things like trapped in there and then something happens to you and the, you remember these stories and you're like, you're like, when was the last time you thought about Mrs. Dixon and, and the horse in Hyde Park, right? Exactly. Yeah. And you know, it was, it was a very random story that I told in a shortened version at BNI once because our theme was we were in a competitive uh, triple crown competition to bring more members into the chapter. Got so it. we had to talk about horses. And I thought, oh, I have a horse story. There you go. And then the more I thought about that, it really just is part of my thread and if you really think about it, you could peg it to getting to where I am all these years later today. Yeah. And it's kind of cool, right? It's because cool. Your journey starts everything right. connects. Yeah, it really does. It really does. I don't think – I think that's one of the things, like you said, now that we're older, you don't appreciate the impact that things have on you when you're young because you're just kind of wandering through life and you're experiencing things. You're running around. I'm sure you were in London. You were nine years. You had 10 years old. You are having a great time and right – and then 
you realize later on and you kind of came out of your shell and the next thing you know, you're getting involved and, and, you know, a lot of confidence is a lot for, you know, weird places that it comes from. Yeah. That's yeah. the fun. It's yeah, exactly. the weirdness. Exactly. The, I remember actually when my mom died, um, I remember speaking to my then boss and saying, it was a sunny afternoon in Westfield and my son had come out from the city and we spent the afternoon together doing things, which was unusual because he was working and I was working. And I, and she said, unique gifts in weird ways. And that's what I'm, I, you know, there's something around every corner. I don't mean to, it's not cockeyed optimism, but you really just got to be in it to appreciate it. And be grateful. No, but that's it makes a, a lot of difference. Life because then you don't miss. Because a lot of things we yeah. miss because we're so busy dealing with whatever we're dealing with. And, you know, it's unfortunate when the moments are gone and you try and capture them whenever you can. Because you don't know when they're going to stop. And when, you know, because I remember, when, you know, and I'm sure you had the same experience. When my dad passed away, you know, life just continues. Like things just happen and he's not there or she's not there. It's not like the events stop happening and life stops happening. You just like turn around and you realize, oh wait, they're not there. That's or you had right. a question for your mom and you realize you can't, you can ask it to her, but she's not going to get right. an answer, you know? And it's, this is weird. It's surreal. I guess that's the word, right? It is very definitely surreal. As we get through. It but really that, is. Know, back to the, the, the content and writing and all that type of stuff. There's a lot of, you know, emotional experiences and things that people experience. It seems to like add to those abilities to express yourself, whether it's in writing or speaking or, whatever. And a lot of it's life experiences. Well, do you know when I went out on my own, so I cut my teeth in corporate life. And in addition to the AM best experience, when I was um, an editor in financial services, I um, wrote for Fox Business Network. Was that a, um, were you a freelance a person then? Or you had I was a contributing job? at for Fox, I was a contributing editor, and I covered workplace issues, leadership. I covered education, healthcare. At the time I was writing on healthcare, it was during the Obama years when they were trying to bring the Affordable Care Act oh, into okay. existence. And but as a um, with the News Bureau, are you like a 1099 employee, or or are you an, a W two employee? Well, when I worked for AM Best, I was a W-2. Okay. I was part of their communications division. Got it. Uh, but uh, for Fox, yeah. I was an, in a 1099, an, an independent contractor. Um, had an article published on education and entrepreneur.com. Oh. Have been a guest blogger for some significant people that I interviewed. Um, and all those were as an independent contractor, um, have had marketing positions, writing editorial, yeah. senior editorial positions in fortune 500 companies. Right. So I've sat on both sides of the desk. Right. And when I went out on my own, um, one of the most frightening things, because your mailbox, once you put yourself out there yeah. and you start doing research online and all that, you start getting all this stuff in your inbox and the intimidation <laughs> of getting stuff in my inbox from people who had MBAs in marketing from Harvard. Yeah. And I thought, Oh, and gee, how am I going to compete? And then this whole concept of story came into mind because just what we're talking about, I realized I had the greatest weapon in my arsenal of all. I had life because the emotions you experience in life right. definitely relate to business. There are lessons there right. in life yeah. that you can apply to business. Right. There's no question. And that is tremendously exciting to find those lessons. And then as a speaker and a writer to be able to convey them, whether I'm doing it, as a professional who's sharing yeah. my insights with others or as a consultant who works with clients and helps them find their voice, find their story. 
sure. um, and create content that makes a difference. Okay, well, why don't we do this? Let's take a commercial break. It's like two minutes. You'll hear the commercials of the people that were at the opening because they do pay me a little bit of money. And um, then maybe we could talk, come back and talk about you know, storytelling and how to you know, make your message resonate and the things that you need to do as a business person, creating content, why it's important, all that type of stuff. Does that make sense? Makes a lot of sense. Okay. And I love to talk about that stuff. I know. So let's go to commercial. We'll be back in about two minutes. Here's a word from our sponsors. Looking to market and grow your business? Or perhaps you're just getting started and want to hit the ground running. AWeber is the best choice for online email marketing and automation of your business. From maintaining a subscriber list to drip campaigns and landing pages, AWeber gives you tools and integrations that make marketing easy and fun. As our partner and sponsor, we use all their tools to promote the podcast and market our law firm. AWeber, the best alternative for online marketing. For over 30 years, the Alternative Board, or TAB, has built a thriving community of forward-thinking CEOs and business owners who want to radically improve their companies. Through unique combinations of one-on-one business coaching, participation in monthly TAB board meetings with other non-competing owners, a suite of strategic tools, and customized strategic planning workshops, TAB membership can deliver greater strength to your business and a better work-life balance for you and your family. All packaged in a streamlined and affordable service that the people at TAB invite you to try risk-free. Maybe you're looking to get into podcasting or you just want to market your business. Maybe you want to do it for enjoyment or because you have a message you want to get out there. One of One Productions is a New Jersey-based studio just over the George Washington Bridge that caters to the booming business of podcasting. They offer a comfortable atmosphere using the latest technology available to record your podcast. And they are a full-service media company offering both audio and video production services, creating both audio and video podcasts, as well as video shorts for business and personal use. Professional audio equipment packages are available through their website for all budgets. And be sure to check out their podcast guesting kit created especially for our listeners. Follow the link in the show notes to learn more about all of our sponsors. And now back to our show. Okay. Thank you for your patience. So we are back. And uh, Barbara, so we started getting into um, storytelling and content and why it's important and what it does for you as a business owner. So I'll leave the stage to you. How's that sound? So general statement um, that content is imperative today. And if you read some of the statistics, well over 50% of marketing professionals use content either representing their own companies or representing their clients. Right. So you can't be out of that group. Right. Um, Of course, it's important because it gives you visibility. No question. Right out of the gate. But there's a lot of levels to content and and little important things that you have to consider that make it special. Right. I want to clarify content for the sake of content, just putting words out there, having it be um, thought out is not going to do it for you. As a matter of fact, it can be negative visibility. Yeah. So there are things you have to consider. Right. Number one. Okay. That old famous expression, what's in it for me? That's the number one customer question. So when you're writing content, think website, for example. Okay. You want to open that web website with the top portion there that's usually quite a splash where you communicate to the customer or the client and you tell them something important about what you do that shows what using your services is in it for them. So you usually think about what's their big pain point, what's their big problem, right? and how does what you do help them. For example, Mitch, in looking at your website, I noticed that when you got deeper down, yeah, you talk about, easy and simple and you cut out a lot of the uh time 
Right. Um, and some of the extraneous legalese kind of stuff that people often worry about when working with an attorney. And that's what takes them to these DIY legal right. services. Sure. And I've talked to many attorneys who say, do not let your friends legal zoom. Right. So what you seem to offer is the best of both worlds. You yeah. provide capability for them to do some DIY, but you offer of uh, the intercession of advisement. So right. yes, you cut the time, you cut a lot of the extraneous, maybe yeah. almost dramatic yeah, if red you're a young tape. Couple, you don't need to be spending all this time. You'll never get it done. And yeah, exactly. Legal zoom and saving a few hundred more bucks. This is, you have no advice. There's no attorney, and yeah. So what if your website, you know, opened with something like, um, the law, easy and simple for you? Right away, they know you're a law firm, and they also know that you're offering them something special. It's good easy, advice. simple access. Yeah. So that's the type of thing I mean answering the customer question right off the hopper of what's in it for them. The The second thing that I think is so important is the idea of um, going beyond the transaction. So if you're a landscaper, okay. it is not just, I came and I cut your lawn today. Right. What's the real outcome? The real outcome is I came and cut your lawn so you can relax this weekend and enjoy time with your family right. and not have to work in the yard. Or because I came and cut your lawn and you can be assured when people drive down your street, your house, we'll stand your there. outdoor environment will turn heads. Feeling There's a higher hit. One's cut. And, and I think that. Isn't it a good feeling when you come home and the lawn's cut? Yes. And yes. Oh, and everything looks so clean and you want to walk around the yeah. back. I don't think landscapers take enough advantage of that. I don't think that they really realize the marketing opportunity, right? To their customers, they come home. They should leave something, a card. I hope you enjoy your backyard, you know? Think of me when yes. you're having a drink on the, on, the, on the lawn. I don't know. Well, you know, one of the opening lines in the homepage that I did for um, a big landscaper out in Silicon Valley was come home to your outdoor oasis. Yeah. Um, so, again, there's an emotional. Paints a picture. There. It paints a picture. It's very visual. It is not just cutting the lawn. Right. And then the rest of your content needs to support all those things. The what's in it for me, yeah. the, um, the, uh, you know, the emotional hit. Um, it needs to continually show people what life will look like when they use your services. Content in general, you know, if you have a blog, it kind of opens the window to the customer experience. You provide value because you give information. You talk about the kinds of problems and show that you understand them. And then through all this writing, you show you don't tell you have the expertise. You know, I call it a gerbil cage, but people, all of us as entrepreneurs are so busy trying to prove ourselves that we have oftentimes talk about ourselves right. too much on a website, a blog, or what have you, right. when it really has to be geared towards the customer. The content, and finally, the you mean not about you, but about what you do and what you can do for them. Exactly. Right. It always there. links to the customer. Little. Exactly. Right. And then finally, the energy. You know, uh, words are important. I'm the first one to say it. Choosing the right words are important. But conveying those words with an energy that's all yours, that's really, too, where the magic happens. It's hard to do. Because that's where you show your personality, your voice. That's the magnet that attracts people. That's when you really develop this synergy between you and your ideal customer. Yeah. 
And you can do that in writing as well as you can do it in speaking. How you structure your sentences. Do you have one word sentences sometimes where there's a dash or an ellipsis that shows there's a pause? That's the stuff that's creative that injects emotion into your piece. Yeah. And about that, to get to that energy and emotion, you have to keep digging deep to find your gifts, to find your talents, to explore your wins. And you have to picture yourself being Rocky in the movie Rocky, running up the steps of that park in Philadelphia, raising his hand in the air, people following him because it's contagious. And the more you tell your story, the more empowered you feel, the more empowered you feel, you show yourself better and there's a stronger connection with the audience. And you know what? Also very recently, I call that whole experience of getting to that energy Mm -hmm. and having that impact. Yeah. I call it finding your purple because purple (laughs) is a color of high energy of expressing your uniqueness, of following your dreams. And so I kind of started to talk about that as a new component when I give speeches, this idea of finding your purple. I have to tell you, since I've been saying it, I'm seeing purple everywhere. And by the way, the little squares on the screen are purple. Purple. (laughs) <laughs> I'm just thinking that when you said that. It's made to be you know, this you podcast. Made a, you made a good comment before about, um, you know, ideal, you know, writing to your ideal person. And I think that a lot of people don't realize that they don't have to try and create content to attract everybody. They can create content to attract the people that they want to attract. And I think we don't spend the time figuring out who that person is or who that per- who you want that person to be, right? We can choose as business owners to do business with whoever we want. And I think that people miss that. And Emma, maybe that'll and help them a little bit too, I think. I, I, You know, to that point, I think sometimes people are trying so hard to be something right. that will appeal to everyone that they end up when not, actually yeah. they have to be themselves and appeal to a yeah. smaller crowd. Right. Um, and they're more successful that way. They're, you know, yeah. you, it's a niching down and becoming very specific and an authority, let's say, in certain areas really attracts people that want to do business with you, the right kind of people. And you end up making more money. And I think you enjoy more what you do, right? Because you're not working. Absolutely. I want to work with you. Feel like, oh, I got to write whatever I can to get content out there and just do business with whoever I can. So I just make money. And maybe that's true at the beginning when you're young and you're, you know, you have no business and you're really struggling, but you have to really as quickly as possible start to really get specific about your message and who you want to meet who you want to connect with and who you, what you want to be an authority on is if you keep writing about, let's use horseback riding, for example, let's say you got older and you're like, I don't like horseback riding anymore, but you kept writing about it because you were good at writing <laughs> and whatever, <laughs> right. You have all these followers in horse, in the horseback riding industry and you don't want to do business there. <laughs> there was no real connection. Yeah. Right. Miss Dixon even may have followed me. <laughs> right, exactly. I assume Miss Dixon is not around anymore, probably. I would assume nine, she's gone so. to the great yeah. equestrian beyond. <laughs> exactly. exactly. I would think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so what What are some of the, like, you, you read a lot of content, obviously, and you're out there and so forth, and you said about messaging and what's in it for me type of stuff. So what other mistakes do you see that people make? Like, some maybe little small mistakes, common Maybe they're bigger mistakes, but what kind of things that you see commonly? So again, talking too much about themselves. Okay, right. You said that. And also misunderstanding this idea of story. Okay. Um, people, uh, well, first of all, a lot of people think they can't find stories. Right. And I addressed that earlier by saying, open your mind, have curiosity, right. tweak your awareness. But second of all, people often think that story is a and then this happened kind of saga. Right. So so I got in my car and I dropped the clothes, getting them into the back seat. But then I organized everything and I got out of the car and I walked up the steps <laughs> and I brought them into the cleaners. Right. Every detail. And, and people do that. I don't know if you've read stuff. It's very common on Facebook. People are telling the whole sad stories 
of their lives, right. you know, whether they're overweight or their mother paid attention to their brother instead right. of them. And they tell every like little detail. Them, right. And story to the contrary is all about essence and intention. So I have a theory on how you create a story or how you would do even a commercial in BNI or a longer speech that you're giving to someone. First, you brain dump. You write it. You right. write Get down. down and all that you can. Right. Then you boil it down. And you start looking at that brain dump and you say, so what's essential there and what is going to get me to the conclusion that I want to conclude my story with, with which I, sh I conclude my story. got to do good <laughs> grammar too. Yeah. So, uh, and then finally you energy it up or level it up because when you finally have that story written, Again, you tell it, and I must repeat this, I feel so strongly about this, an energy that's all yours, yeah. and that brings it to life. So it's brain dump, boil down, build up in terms of the energy. I see it as a three-step process, the three Bs, and that's what makes a good story. I often tell people you have to reverse engineer. And you have to okay. think about what are the key things? What, what do I think about life? What's my point of view? What are my values and my beliefs? And what, what do I want to prove in XYZ story? Because yeah. all of us have many stories. We have a primary right one, there. but we have a lot of sub stories. So what do I want to prove? If you know what you want to prove, then you can do that boil down where you write or create with intention. Right. As opposed to, uh, you think people write a lot of superfluous things, right? A lot of yes. stuff they don't need to. I yes. deal with that. Like if I have to go to a board hearing at night, cause I'm getting a zoning application for, and they don't have a lawyer. I mean, these people go on, they could be <laughs> the board for two hours. It could have been a 20 minute discussion yep. because they're saying things that are not relevant at all to the, at all. Right? and so if you're writing things that aren't relevant, you kind of like, right, take the reader and kind of bring them down up the wrong path, right? And then they're confused. What am I reading this for? What does this have anything to do? And then you lose them. Well, that's – and that's where clarity comes in because yeah. if you're all over the map, there is no it's clarity. Hard. You're confusing. Right. It's a big phrase now these days yeah. in the story world. But if you're confusing, you're not clear. You don't have clarity. And it, it's true. It, it definitely makes sense. It's too much information. You want to put your head down on the table. Yeah, well, people are just looking for the answer and or what you know. And I, I guess you want to be an authority on a particular topic. You better be concise because if not, they're going to be gone because they can just leave your content and go read something else. You they know? can indeed. The old adage, less is more, right? Yeah, absolutely. My dad, when my dad used to give presentations like for – He's a salesman all of his life, but they used to use this thing that more, the most white wins, like the people that have less on the paper for the presentation because they can explain it. And the person who speaks the last loses. You say as little as you can. You, you basically, you know, and you let people think and you, you don't be afraid. And some people just keep talking and they keep writing and they, they just can't, you know, can't get enough of it. Editing, you know, cutting something down. I love to do that. It's like a puzzle. You know, even if you read oh, over your insight, stuff. More focused and things like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's definitely so fun. I love that phrase of your dad's, the more white, the better. Yeah. And think about when people talk about website design, how important it is to have a lot of white on the yeah, page. Yeah, clean. Right. Because your eye sees it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It makes so much sense. I read contracts, obviously, from clients that say, oh, I put this together. I don't know if it's great, but maybe you can take a look at it. <laughs> There's so many things that are repeated in this different ways. Then they're saying the same thing six times, and I got to boil it down and clean it up because it just confuses the person who's reading the contract. What are you trying to say? Well, Why are you saying it six times? You know. That's back in the gerbil cage again, right. because and it's back to where we started with trying too hard, that there's a tendency to think, oh, if I say this about myself or if I say this, I'll look very erudite. And really, eh, 
you know, less is more. Mr. Clarkson used to say five cent, not 50 cent words. Right. And that's what makes a good piece of journalism. Now, I wonder what your opinion is of all these new AI technologies. Like, have you seen this website, Chat GPT, where you go in and you could say, you know, write me an article about the various varieties of sunflowers and it will write you an article. It will. Yeah. It's the scariest yet the craziest thing. I asked it to write a, a business agreement, I think an operating agreement. I didn't let it do the whole thing, but it started going through it and indenting and it, put, it looked like my agreement. It was so frightening. It, looked, it is frightening. Yeah, it's, it's big it, brother. Yeah. So I was wondering what your opinion is about this stuff and how I, it may affect all of us. So interestingly, back in about 2010, when I was working for Fox, I was one of a group of reporters who went up to IBM and they were introducing their computer Watson. Yeah, that was and the first Watson, startup, right? Exactly. Yeah. And that seemed so phenomenal then. It was really geared towards healthcare and diagnoses and protocols and such. Yeah. And now look at what's happened. Yeah. Um, I've seen some examples of AI, and there is absolutely no question that if you put in, it's like everything else, you got to put in the right information right, so that it will regurgitate something intelligent. And it is intelligent. I mean, it's even well-written. Right, yeah. But there's some funkiness. Yeah. And I don't think yet we're fully there where it addresses what I'm talking about when I talk energy, you know, the pregnant pause, the uh, interjection of humor that shows who you really are. That said, I'm sure someday we're going to get to that. And I don't, what, I don't know what that means because it is magnificent, but it is also scary. Yeah. Isn't yeah, it, it? It might I, be a good place to start to break writer's block, right? If you said, you know, write me, right? And then you have this starting of a thing and it'll make you think about stuff and you start changing and moving and adding and expanding and correcting. And at least now, I was just talking to somebody at lunchtime today and they said to me that there was a study done where they, because the algorithms are changing, right? If these search engines are going to get smarter, they're going to want to know what content is authentic and what did you just throw into an AI you know, website and you didn't write it yourself and they're going to probably penalize that stuff because it's less relevant. So, and I don't know how they do that now, but he said they took like an AI written article and a human written article and they ran it through one of these like SEO checkers that look at it for relevance and key terms. And the human one was just a richer, you know, more expansive article than the, than the AI robotic one. Because, because well, that I now, I, so I've heard, and I even know people, not writers necessarily, but people in business yeah. who have used AI, and they are talking about using it as a starter. Right. So in that comparative example that you gave, say it was the same topic, I'm yeah, not sure that right. it was, Yeah. but if you, you're absolutely right, Mitch, if you have this, you have a base, and then you are also absolutely right that it would obviously get the juices flowing and you would start getting into moving things around or maybe I want to expound on this point. So I'm going to dig a little deeper and inject something of myself. That I think is really the ultimate. The good use. Using it as a tool and not leaving the human element out. You know, that, that things... What is it? The whole is only as good as the sum of its parts. Right. Well, that, we are human, right? We do write. We're English yeah. speaking people. Yep. So if you're in Japanese in Japan, your AI thing's going to write in a different language. So, you know, the human, you can't, I don't think you ever want to get rid of the human element. Then we'll, never. what are we here for? But never. And we need it now more than ever because for sure. it's a very fractured world. One thing about AI, yeah. I've, I'm fascinated what it's going to do application process. Now, I recognize that the college essay isn't necessarily as important as it used to be, but it, it in, in terms of admissions, right. but it is helpful 
in terms of advanced placement opportunities. And you, what is that going to do to the ethics yeah, of I, a kid? I know. That's an interesting yeah, topic. I don't know. Even I for think. college essays, I guess that was always hard for the kids. And now they can go put some in, have a starting yeah. point yeah. and expand it from there. But uh, yeah, I don't, we'll have to see what happens. But I, I look, n- people like you are not going to be gone. We, you know, there's, it's an art to, and a skill that's hard to learn um, to writing things. And we write things more than we ever used to because of web based marketing and all the marketing the business owners do, you know, just put an ad in the newspaper and let it run for six weeks. You know, it's different now. It changes all the time. So, you know, people have to learn. And that's why I wanted to have you on today to talk about all this stuff, writing good content, how you do it. So how can people, I know we're coming up on the hour. How can people interact with you, learn from you, find you, follow you? What are all the all of your stuff. Well, when I will have my contact information in my bio, which yep. you will be publishing. Yep. But my website is simple. Once you know how to spell my last name, it's barbaramenino.com. Okay. And for people watching um, this, your name is in the left corner there. So if they're listening, they can look in the show notes. And and also I have a chat with barb.com site. Okay. Um, that I have a lot of that I'll use it to for PDF giveaways. So there's an opportunity there. Like an ebook. And of course, type I'm of on thing. Facebook and pardon like me. An ebook type of a thing. I don't have an ebook up yet. Um, I have, as you know, written a book for attorneys actually, okay. and I've also contributed two chapters that I'm very proud of on story to uh, business books but uh, these are more like uh, checklists oh, okay. and uh, like yeah type and uh, I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn of course and I um, want to get more active in insta and I'm also on on Twitter so all right well I appreciate you coming on today thank you very much I know it's late on a Friday. Um, but, and I will see you next Friday at our networking meeting. You will, I will be there. And I so enjoyed this. It was really great. It was, it's always good to talk to you. Thanks, Barbara. Thank you for listening to this episode of the accidental entrepreneur opening and closing music written and performed by Howie Moscovich and made to order music for information about Howie and his music services. Please follow the link in our show notes. If you like the podcast, please tell others about us. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, on Amazon Music, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and most of the other podcast directories. If you like what you hear, please leave us a five-star review and feel free to share our episodes on social media. If you have any questions or comments, ideas for the show, or you'd even like to appear as a guest, reach out to us by email at info at buyneckerlaw.com. The Accidental Entrepreneur is hosted by Mitch Beinacker and produced by Beinacker Law. If you'd like to learn more about our business and legal services, you can find us on social media or visit our website at BeinackerLaw.com. Thanks for listening and be sure to subscribe to our feed to be notified of all future episodes.